Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here and I want to make sure that I can share my screen um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself before I get into uh, notes and the wonderful world of note investing. So let's see if I can make sure to make this happen. Yes, I am Paige Fanzarello. I am the cash flow chick. Uh, and I have been investing uh, in real estate for over 25 years. Um, oh I kind of got mm -hmm. into the real estate investing sphere, not uh, of my own volition. It was real estate chose me. I did not choose it. Uh, my grandmother had passed away and she had a really sizable estate, uh, some holdings in California and also in Arizona. And they were severely in debt. Uh, so the Arizona properties were about $4 million in debt. And in my young 20s, uh, off I went to Arizona to try and figure out if I could salvage any of this stuff. So I had 38 townhome units. We had a sewer treatment plant. Uh, yes, that is a crappy business. Um, and we had some land. <laughs> Um, and again, I was I was in my early 20s. I didn't know anything about real estate or real estate investing. And there weren't things like this. We didn't have this technology. We didn't have um, schooling and, and RIA groups and and meetings that we could, you know, do from thousands of miles away. So I had to surround myself with people that had the answers to the questions that I had to ask. And I figured out pretty quickly that I was pretty good at this real estate thing. Um, the townhome units were about 40% occupied. Half of those uh, vacant units were broken. And so I had to, I was doing fixing and flipping kind of before it was a thing. Um, and I didn't even know it. So within about a year and a half, I was able to put everything back in the black. Uh, we were 100% occupied. And I said, you know, I think I want to build on that land. Now, I knew nothing about building or construction. And so I, I hired a contractor, I designed a project with an architect and off I went. Um, we did sell the sewer treatment plant and we did sell the, the townhome units and that was how I leveraged that money to build on the land. Um, and I realized very quickly that the contractor was gonna bankrupt me before I even came out of the ground. And so I fired him and I started my own construction company. And I knew nothing about construction at all. Um, but I quickly learned. And what I did is, is I found a qualifying party. So I found a gentleman that was a contractor and I brought him on board as a shareholder in my corporation. My corporation held all of our licenses except HVAC and roofing. Um, and only because the liability insurance was so expensive, uh, we, we subbed that out. And we started building and we were doing really, really well. And this is the beginning in the early 2000s. Um, so, you know, before we even got to 2005, 2006, and we were building and making money hand over fist. And I was working like a dog. And I'll tell you, that life was great because I had a lot of liquidity. I had a lot of assets. I made a ton of money. The problem was, is that I was eight, working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And the stress of all of that was putting me in an early. Not 2007. Um, and this, the crash started to happen, right? We're just getting to 2008. Um, I really was, was seriously considering what am I doing? You know, how I'm away from my family because you had to be on, I had to be on site in Arizona. My family's all in California. And I decided, um, and I was looking at the numbers and I thought, this is not going to be able to be sustained. Uh, and I saw that the crash was coming. And I mistakenly thought, because I was young and naive, that it wasn't going to happen to me. And I'll tell you, it happened right on my head. Um, and I actually do consider this a blessing. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, I was, I was very fortunate in that I had a lot of liquidity. I had a lot of assets that I could sell, a lot of cash flowing assets, um, big pieces of equipment, et cetera. Uh, and at the time when the crash happened, people that owed me money could not pay me. Okay, so a lot of them filed for bankruptcy. I chose not to do that. I liquidated everything uh, that I owned. It took me about three years and I fire sailed it because, you know, cash was king at that point and it was literally pennies on the dollar. But I did pay everybody that I owed money to, including my investors. 
Uh, and I walked away three years later having lost $20 million. Now, it's kind of strange to call that a blessing, right? Losing $20 million <laughs> as a blessing. It really was a very difficult learning experience for me. Um, however, it shaped me as an investor. It shaped how I treat people. It shaped how I treated money. It shapes how I treat my investments. Um, and I went from being very bold to being rather risk averse, right? So when I, when I decided, of course I went away from real estate for a little bit. I had to lick my wounds and regroup. And when I came back in, I decided I was going to do it smarter. And because of my blessing, I was able to get myself to a place where I am now, which is in non-performing notes. Now, again, um, it, when I got to this space, when I came back into real estate, I was nervous. I was scared, of course. I mean, I lost a ton of money, but I was smarter for it. And I thought I had heard about notes. What is this notes thing? And when I started studying it and then I started investing in it, I can tell you that angels sang for me. Um, and I think once you hear some of what I have to say this evening, uh, that you might tend to agree. So let's kind of get into this and discuss what are notes. Um, notes are basically just a promise to pay. That's what a note is. And it is usually attached to some collateral. So there's a variety of different of different notes, um, and I'm going to discuss, discuss that in a moment. But literally, when you invest in a note, you become the bank. And yes, you really do become the bank. You don't have to have a storefront, right? Um, any of you, as a matter of fact, that have, have heard uh, from Brent Kessler, um, he talks about being your own bank. So yes, you become somebody else's bank. Uh, and it is possible to do just as a singleton investor, okay? So there are different types of notes that you can buy. There are notes that are secured by cars. So if you finance a car, you're going to sign a note, you're going to sign that promise to pay, and the collateral for that promise is the car. Same thing when you buy a house. So when you buy your house, you promise to pay the bank back the money at over a certain period of time, right? Um, at a certain payment every single month at a certain interest rate. And the collateral for that is the house. Now there are non-performing notes, there's performing notes. There are first position liens, there are second position liens. I invest in first position, non-performing uh, notes that are secured by real estate, okay? So the difference between, of course, performing and non-performing is just what it sounds like. Performing notes are notes that are the borrower is paying every single month, on time, every time. That's a performing note. So if you want to have cash flow, then the performing note might be one of the ways you can get there without the headache of the tenants and the toilets because you are the bank, not the landlord, okay? There's a difference. You're buying the debt and it's secured by the house, okay? Non-performing notes is exactly what it sounds like. The borrower has stopped paying. So I just told you that I invest in first position non-performing notes, which means I'm the first to get paid because I'm the first position, but my borrower has stopped paying. So that sounds really crazy, right? Why on earth would I buy a non-performing note? Well, because I buy them at a substantial discount based on the current market value of the securing collateral. And we're gonna talk about some of those numbers tonight uh, in a little bit, but it's, it's crazy like a fox because again, I'm buying the note where, and I'm building in some equity because I'm getting a very big discount because it has stopped performing, okay? Um, I'm often asked the question, is there competition in note investing? And, and yes, there is competition in any kind of real estate or real estate investing that you do. But I like to say it's, it's a gentler form of investing. It's a lot more collaborative in this space. 
Um, right now, especially, there's there. I mean, people go crazy with with the real estate market, especially when it's going up, up, up. Right? Um, they, I, I know of people that are that are being outbid by a hundred thousand dollars over asking. That's not so in the note investing space. In the note investing space, we do have some competition. However, we we literally make an offer to our asset manager. He either says yes, no, or he counters. Okay, there's no back and forth. There's no um, outbidding other people. You know, in a in the frenzied auction, none of that. Um, so it's a much gentler form of investing. And, and I tend to appreciate the gentler and more collaborative forms of investing. So that's one of the check marks in the boxes for me that it fits. Um, the other question that I ask, I'm often asked is, well, this sounds great, Paige, becoming the bank, but how do you find deals? Because as you know, there are lots of things that are, that are out there in terms of having to find deals. There's two things that everybody looks for, money and deals, deals and money. And in the note space, I spend zero marketing dollars, zero. I do not spend any money at all on marketing. I do not send out yellow letters. I don't knock on doors. I do not do cold calls. I do not, um, I don't drive for dollars, none of those things. How I find my deals is I build relationships. I build relationships with asset managers. I build relationships with other note investors. I build relationships with people in real estate that refer note people to me. Um, so all I do is I, that's where I put my dollars. Um, now in a time where we could travel a little bit more than we have been able to this last year, uh, you know, going to conventions, going to symposiums, creating relationships. And once I've established those relationships, I literally have deals that come directly to my inbox. I don't, I don't have to do anything but build relationships. Um, and I happen to like people, so that fits for me really well as well. <laughs> um, we are gonna talk tonight about some market trends that have been going on because we have been in a really strange time in the last, I'm gonna call it 18 months. Um, so I wanted to point out some of the numbers and some of the opportunity that is right around the corner, okay? Now, these are numbers. I watch the numbers much like Larry watches his numbers. I watch the numbers um, in the real estate cycle and defaulted debt because that's where I specialize. So I, in November of 2019, these are real numbers, okay? This is just my asset class right here. This is residential single family residences, one to four first position liens. Okay, so no seconds, no HELOCs, uh, no commercial, not industrial, none of that, just my little asset class here, okay? So at the end of November, 2019, we were looking at non-accrual bad debt, which means over 90 days plus and accruing of $57.46 billion, okay? Again, just my asset class. Now, we went into, as you know, the last year um, with COVID and COVID hitting, the numbers were very, very similar in, at the end of September and also at the end of December, largely because forbearance agreements were put into place. We'll talk about forbearance in a little bit. That same asset class, we were looking at $75.53 billion in defaulted mortgages. Okay, severely delinquent. That's an $18 billion difference. Now, for note investors, while unfortunately it's terrible, of course, for the homeowners, it is a huge opportunity for us as note investors. Okay, and, and even in 2008, this did not happen. I mean, 23.92% increase in less than a year's period of time. Normally we have increases that are anywhere between one and 3% per year because life happens every single day to people. So this is a massive opportunity that's coming down the pike. Now we've had the government propping us up um, and, and offsetting some of this, but I'm telling you that the numbers are continuing to go up, up and up. And at one point, the moratoriums and the um, stopping, the moratoriums on foreclosure and eviction are going to stop. Um, also, the stimulus money is going to have to stop uh, because it, it's going to implode, okay? 
All right, so just a couple of headlines I wanted to show you. Uh, distressed debt balloons to almost $1 trillion nears the 2008 peak. This was an early, um, an early headline, everybody. We've already surpassed this. We've actually surpassed when it combines all debt. Now, remember, I just showed you my little asset class. But when it combines all debt, we're already over $1 trillion, and we've already surpassed 2008 peaks, okay? Um, and mortgage defaults could pile up at a, at a pace that dwarfs uh, 2008, and we're already there as well. Here's another thing that is of, of, of high importance, and that is if anybody's ever heard of Oak Tree Capital, uh, Howard Marks is a gentleman that runs that particular hedge fund. It's quite large. It's got $19.4 billion under management um, for other holdings, real estate included. And it came out that uh, Oak Tree Capital is going, it was starting a fund uh, for $15 billion just to buy distressed mortgages. Now, are they stupid or do they know something we don't know, right? Of course, they know something that we don't know. Um, but now I'm telling you. So hopefully you'll do a little investigation, investigating yourself because this is a huge opportunity that is coming around the corner. And I believe, it's in my opinion, obviously, no guarantees. Um, but I do believe that this is, once this wave really starts hitting, we're probably going to have about a three or four year run on it. Um, so the opportunities are really going to present themselves not only to make money, but to help people. Um, and, and that's something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later on, okay? Now, again, that's just today. You say, that's great, Paige, but what happens at the end of three years? You know, why should I invest this, this time into education if it's only going to last for three years? And I always tell people in my workshops, listen, life happens every single day to people. There's always going to be death. There's always going to be divorce. Um, there's always downsizing and job loss. Of course, medical issues and bills, that's another one. So in this business, there's always going to be opportunity because people are accustomed to living in their home. However, there's always some sort of life that happens to each one of us every single day. Now, I wanna point out, just because people are behind in their mortgage does not mean that they're bad people. It just means that life has happened to them. So you ask me, okay, do you really become the bank? Yes, so how do you make money? Well, again, by becoming the bank. Banks control the transaction. Banks dictate the terms. Banks collect the money. Banks set the timetable. There's a tremendous amount of control in this space for your invested dollars. It's really good to be the bank. Also, when I was in Arizona, I had to be in Arizona. I was away from my family. I was away from my friends. I was away from my support system. This um, mode of investing for me, I literally can do this business anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection and a cell phone which is pretty cool. So let's talk about some exit strategies. Now in note investing, I will tell you there are 23 different exit strategies that we have available to us. We do not use all 23 every single day. Typically, we only use four, okay? And I'm gonna run some numbers here so you can see some of the easy math. And we're gonna keep it really easy um, because my little brain at the end of the day, <laughs> Uh, likes easy, right? So unpaid principal balance. Okay, so this is just the, the principal portion of the loan that remains unpaid, okay? Unpaid principal balance of the, is the principal portion of the mortgage. So $100,000 for this particular note, okay? Legal collectible balance is is all of the default interest, any, any of the missed payments, any late payments, any property preservation, any insurance. Now we as note investors are legally allowed to do what's called force placing the insurance, which means because our borrowers have probably have stopped paying their mortgages and very likely their, their taxes and their insurance were impounded in their payment, 
uh, then, then there's no insurance covering the house. So we have the legal right to protect the collateral that is securing our invested dollars. So if we force place the insurance, that all becomes part of the legal collectible balance. And there's many, many things that go into that pot. We're not going to touch on all of them, but you get the idea. So for Okay. The current market value of the securing collateral, AKA the house is $80,000. So you can see already this borrowers underwater by $40,000, okay? Now for us, remember how I said a little while ago that I buy the note based on a discounted rate of the current market value of the securing collateral. So I'm going to buy the note based on the $80,000 even though I'm owed 120, okay? So for again, easy math, I'm gonna say 50%. So I buy this note where I'm owed $120,000, I buy it for $40,000, okay? Now, much like fixing and flipping properties um, where you have rehab costs, you know, if you take a broken house, you have to fix it if you're fixing and flipping it. So there's rehab costs to do that. I'm taking broken notes and I'm fixing it and either holding on to it for cash flow or I'm gonna sell it for a chunk of cash. So my workout costs, and again, easy math, typically they will vary depending upon judicial versus non-judicial foreclosure states. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, but they're anywhere between five and $8,000 depending um, on a couple of different factors uh, for a 12 to 14 month period of time, okay? So easy math, we're gonna talk about tonight, $5,000. We're gonna use the low end of the spectrum. So my all in to this note is $45,000. Again, I'm owed 120,000, but the house is only worth 80, okay? So I, I do my numbers, anything above the $80,000 is kind of the cherry on top of the sundae, right? It's gravy, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attaboy, it's a, a kind of a bonus. But as I go into this note, you can see that I've built in already $35,000, that, that's my equity cushion, that mitigates my risk, okay? Because if the market crashes, let's say that the market drops, um, and it does do that, as we all know, it goes up and down, it's very cyclical. Uh, let's say, and, and historically, even the crash of 2008, when it crashed, uh, most areas were not hit by a 50% 50, 50 reduction, certainly not in six months period of time. Most areas were hit about 20 to 25 percent. So if, in fact, we do have another correction that hits very fast and very hard, I'm still OK here because I've built in so much equity that even a 25 percent dip is not going to affect me too badly. Right. I still actually probably am going to be a little profitable uh, at, even at a 25 percent dip. And again, don't forget, there's 23 different exit strategies. So as long as I'm willing to pivot, then very likely I'm going to I'm going to be able to save off or mitigate against loss in this space. OK. All right. So that being said, let's talk about and, and the, uh, those four exit strategies that we use on a day to day basis. Now, you can see I have the numbers off to the right because we're going to talk about that a little bit. My least favorite is foreclosure. That's that's an exit strategy that, that is available to us as the bank. Uh, uh, there, a, con, a foreclosure auction is always an auction and it just depends on judicial versus non-judicial states where, um, where the auction is gonna be held and who conducts it, okay? In a judicial foreclosure state, which is about 50% of the states in the country, uh, judicial foreclosure states, you actually have to go to court and ask permission from the judge to foreclose. Now that typically takes a little bit longer. Um, generally speaking, it will take about eight to, well, under normal circumstances, eight to 12 months. Um, some states have prolonged a little bit because they've had an influx uh, of filings, even though there's been a moratorium, right? Um, so I am typically now looking in today's time about anywhere exiting a note between eight and and 
12 months, let's say, in a judicial or 16 months in a judicial foreclosure state. Sorry. In a non-judicial foreclosure state, uh, it's a lot less time. It's generally a little less money. Um, and the, the auction, you don't have to go to a judge to foreclose. Um, the trustee will hold the auction, the public auction for foreclosure. In the judicial foreclosure state, the sheriff will hold the foreclosure auction. And usually it's on the courthouse steps. The trustee, it's usually at the location of the property. Okay. Now, again, the trustee, we have to just publicly notice. So once we get through that, um, a foreclosure is just, is typically going to take uh, in about six to seven months, give or take, in a non-judicial foreclosure state. Okay. So let's look at our numbers. If we if we take this to auction and we sell it to a third party as at, at the foreclosure auction, and let's say we only we started the we as the bank get to open the bid so we get to start the opening bid we get to tell either the sheriff or the trustee what we want to start the bidding at so let's say we did this a little lower and we ended up as as um selling it to a third party at foreclosure auction just for seventy thousand dollars and let's say we are in a non-judicial foreclosure state and in six months we made now, not we didn't hit our eighty thousand dollar mark, right? But we did hit seventy. So in six months, we made twenty five thousand dollars just by fixing, buying, and fixing the paper. Um, I like to call this return on transaction. I don't call it return on investment because, again, return on transaction is a shorter period of time. Return on investment usually refers to twelve months, so one year period of time. In this scenario, if we're in a non-judicial foreclosure state um, and we sell it in six months and make $25,000, who'd be happy with that? I certainly would all day long, right? There are certain states that don't fit my model. So for instance, New York uh, does not fit my model of investing. Judicial foreclosure state and the foreclosure process takes about four years. I don't like my money sitting idle like that. So I don't even look at assets that are in New York. I just avoid them altogether. Uh, they don't fit my buy box. Okay. All right. So our second uh, exit strategy is short sale. Pretty much everybody knows what a short sale is. It sounds, it's exactly what it sounds. We are owed, um, we are owed, of course, the $120,000. Our borrower might come to us and say, you know what, the neighbor next door is interested in buying this property and they're willing to spend, you know, they're willing to, to pay you $80,000, which is the current market value. Now, how fast do you think I'm gonna say yes? Probably pretty fast, right? It's not the days of 2008 all the way through to 2013. And 13. If any of you participated in short sales at that point, Sometimes the banks were taking anywhere between nine and 18 months to make a decision, yes or no, on a short sale. As we are at the, as the bank, it just takes us a, a matter of looking at our numbers and saying yes or no, okay? Um, it can take as little as three, three to six months. And the reason for that is because there are some transfer things that need to happen when you buy a note. There are certain notifications that need to happen to the for the borrower and with the borrower. Um, and then the borrowers have been beat up. Remember these big banks oftentimes hound them uh, to, because they're delinquent and they're defaulting on their mortgage. So they're not gonna pick up the phone immediately and start talking with my loss mitigation team. Uh, sometimes they, you know, they, they bury their head in the sand and they hope that it's gonna go away like an ostrich and it doesn't. Um, and that's something also that I love about this is that I've got a really big heart. So I, it's hard for me in terms of borrowers because I know life is happening to them. So the cool thing about note investing is that I actually use a loss mitigation team. They're licensed debt collectors and they do all the contact uh, with my borrowers and then they're the liaison between myself and the borrowers, okay? Um, so again, they would help to, to facilitate this short sale with the borrower. 
and it might take anywhere from three to six months to complete. Uh, if we don't have a, a buyer yet for the house, then sometimes we will have to list it with a realtor. Um, so that might take a little bit extra time, right? But again, let's say that, that we sell this property and we agree, even though we're owed 120, we're gonna sell it to that neighbor, right? For $90,000. Keep in mind that the value of some of a property is in the eye of the beholder, right? So that neighbor might have plans for that house and be willing to pay a little extra above and beyond what the current market value is. So now in a three month or a six month period of time, our return on transaction is higher because we've now sold that property. Uh, we've shorted the sale. Um, but we've now sold that property for $90,000 and, and instead of the, the $80,000. So instead of $35,000, we've now made $45,000. Again, we control this whole transaction. We are the deciding factor in all of this, okay? Now, we don't have to sell it to a neighbor. Let's say, let's say we, um, we sell it to somebody that wants to buy it and, and they wanna fix and flip it. So we can actually make money twice on this same asset. And the reason for that is we're willing to accept $80,000 or $90,000, um, but our buyer needs a lender. So what if we lent to the new buyer and, and we acted as a hard money lender? right? So they might uh, be become a borrower for us on that same property that we're willing to short the sale. It's kind of cool how that works. And of course, that that buyer can, um, you know, can turn it into a, uh, their own residence or short term rental or buy and hold property, etc. All right, a deed. The third one is a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And this is where the borrower comes to us and says, all right, Mrs. Chase, um, I don't, I, I have bad memories in this house, but I don't want a foreclosure uh, on my record, on my credit record. Um, so I, I need out of this house. Would you be willing to accept the deed to this property as payment in full for my loan, okay? Um, that is a process that can take anywhere from, again, three to six months, sometimes shorter. Uh, and we now are going to take possession of the actual property. Now, that sounds great, but there are some pitfalls because remember what I said, I buy first position liens, which means I'm the first to get paid. However, there might be a second mortgage behind me or a, a judgment behind me. Uh, and if I accept this deed in lieu of foreclosure to the house and I take the house as payment in full, my loan goes away and now I, I, everybody moves up. So the second position now becomes a first position. So there's some steps to due diligence that you want to, to take uh, long before you agree to a deed in lieu of foreclosure, but it's a, a tremendous option for us, especially if you're looking to take the actual house, okay? So again, if we take that deed lieu of foreclosure, what if we turn around and we sell it as an REO, right, for $80,000? Now we've got a return on transaction again of our $35,000. Um, we could be the bank again for a fix and flipper. We could turn it into our own short-term rental um, or a buy and hold property. It's just endless what we can do uh, as the bank when we take a property back. Now again, I don't like I don't like kicking people out of their homes. So if that's your exit strategy, and it is for a lot of people, and that's fine. I just often when I'm at the at my workshop and I'm teaching, I, I tell my students, listen, please, you know, if you want the house, cool, that's great, but please focus more on notes that are already vacated by the borrower because, in my opinion, every home has a heartbeat, and it's really difficult to kick somebody out of their house. Uh, so if you want the house, excellent, but please just focus on the ones that are already vacant so you're not kicking families out, okay? Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. We are a business, we're not a philanthropy. Uh, sometimes we have to take off our heart hat and put on our hard hat, uh, but we hopefully won't have to get to, to that, you know, to that end uh, if, we're, if we're in a position to work with our borrowers which is the perfect segue and brings me to my favorite exit strategy, which is this one. 
re-performing, okay? You've been hearing a lot these days about forbearance agreements and, and that's also in my space known as a trial payment plan. Um, a a re-performing loan is when we get, we work hand in hand with the borrower and we give them a second chance. We, we create a trial payment plan first. I never go directly to a loan modification, but the, the borrower's gotta have a little skin in the game. They've gotta participate and prove that they can actually make the mortgage payments that you're proposing uh, when we go to a loan modification. So for a six month period of time, uh, we work with the borrower under a trial payment plan, also known as a forbearance agreement. And then if our borrower is successful, we, we will convert that trial payment plan or that forbearance agreement into a permanent loan modification. Now, you can, there's a variety of different things that you can do in a, because again, we're the bank. We wanna set our borrowers up to succeed. We don't want them to fail. So we have to work kind of within the parameters of what they're capable of doing. However, there's so many different advantages. If we look here at, at the amount of money that they owe us, they owe us $120,000, right? Um, but, and the house is only worth 80, so they're, they're underwater. Well, let's say that they have had a family, their family living there for 20 years, they wanna stay. It doesn't matter what the, the current market value of the property is, it's, it's in the, the value is in the eye of the beholder. So we might be able to do a variety of different things uh, where we can forgive some of the debt forgive some of the arrearage, right? And make it more manageable. We can lower or increase interest rates and there are fun ways to do that. It sounds crazy to increase an interest rate, but if you extend the length of the loan, that will bring the payment down. Um, of course, forgiveness of debt, reducing the unpaid principal balance, et cetera. So in this case, let's say we reduce $20,000 of the debt, we're still, the house is still a little bit underwater, but it's more manageable for our borrower and they wanna stay. Now, again, in this scenario, we need them to have a little bit of skin in the game, right? So we ask them for a deposit and then we're gonna have them prove that they, for six months, that they can afford the payment, the new proposed payment, by the way. And then once they do, we turn, we turn the trial into the permanent modification. Here's the interesting thing that happens there. We're creating a chunk of cash and monthly cash flow for six months. That's free money, everybody, because that applies to the old loan. The minute that we modify the loan, we start the clock all over. So that new loan starts at month one. It's a refi of, the, of an old loan, okay? So that prior six months in the trial, that's free money. Once the loan modification goes in place, if you've ever taken a look at an amortization schedule, you will see that the bulk of your payment is, is mostly interest. Um, it doesn't hit in a 30 year mortgage. It doesn't hit to mostly principal until year 17, everybody. So when you're refining your loan over and over and over and over again, you're resetting the clock and you're paying a lot of interest up front. Um, so keep that in mind, but that's how we as banks make money, right? But we created a situation where the borrower's happy, they get to stay in their home and we're getting to create um, some cash flow and some wealth for ourselves as well. That's a win-win. Okay, so how important is due diligence? Massively important. Uh, I, again, this is something in my workshop we go over day after, I mean, just a massive amount of due diligence. I like to say uh, that note investing is very front end loaded. And what I mean by that is you spend the bulk of your time doing your due diligence and, and researching and, and spending your time before you buy the note. And then after you buy the note, you hand it off to your teams, your loss mitigation team and your servicing company, and they handle the day to day. Okay, so very front end loaded. Due diligence is absolutely key. Okay, it will give you virtually risk free note investing. Um, I also say that there's no such thing as a bad note, but there is such a thing as buying notes badly. 
okay? So due diligence is your key. It mitigates your risk and it gives you happy note investor investing days. Okay, so some case studies. Let's talk about some case studies. Everybody wants to see the numbers. Now these are, are in from my portfolio. These are actual case studies that myself and my team have worked out. This first one <clears throat> is a, a note that was on a property, a duplex in Casa Grande, Arizona. Uh, we knew because of our good due diligence uh, via our realtors that have that drove by before we bought the note uh, that the property was occupied. We knew that there were two sets of families living there, um, but we didn't know the tenants, of course. Now, the current market value of this particular property was about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. So are all in for this non-performing note. Again, it was not performing. It had not been performing for years, a lot of years actually. Uh, we acquired it for 64,500 was our all in. So the purchase price plus our workout costs. Uh, we, did, we bought it in late 2018. We did not know who was occupying, but we did know that it was occupied. Uh, we ended up foreclosing on this note and surprisingly to us, it actually came back to us as an REO, which created a bit of a blessing for us. Uh, and I'm gonna get there in just a second. So we started the bid on this one, I think at about $107,000. Um, it did come back to us as an REO. So now we own the duplex. Our loss mitigation team recommended that we start eviction proceedings immediately for the two two families that were living there. And I said, you know, I don't think I wanna do that. So what we did is we sent out a door knock service and the door knock service went to both sides and talked to the families. They, we had learned that they, one family was there for seven years, another family, the other family was there for five. Um, they had been paying rent, but not to our borrower. The beauty was is that they were paying rent to a property manager. So our door knocker asked for the property manager's name and number. We contacted the property manager and there was some rent that she had been holding. So we got to collect that rent, right? So we had a little bit of cash flow there. Um, we told her that we wanted to recapture capital. So we wanted to sell this asset. And we asked her, do you, you know, being that you're a property manager, do you work with investors, especially cash buying investors? And she said, we absolutely do. I said, are you interested? Do you have anybody that would be interested in this property? And she said, I do. So she had the investor, cash buyer. Sure enough, we put the deal together. We sold it 21 days later for cash for $120,000. Um, and we sold it loaded, fully loaded, which means that the tenants stayed. Okay, um, we paid our, our, the property manager a small commission. She was a realtor, you know, so we didn't give her the full amount, but this was an off market deal. So she made some money too. Um, after closing costs, we had a profit of $54,500, approximately a 54% return on transaction. This did happen in less than a year. I think this, the whole process took us seven, eight months. Um, and we ended up, our JV partner ended up with a 25 or 27% return on transaction. Who likes this deal? I could do this deal all day long, right? <laughs> um, the next one, this one is in Richmond, Virginia. Don't fall in love with the houses, by the way, everybody. I, I am a, I call myself a reformed rehabber. I love taking ugly properties and making them beautiful. I just don't like the stuff in between, right? That's work to me. Uh, so I saw this property uh, when, I, when I did the due diligence on this note and the realtor went by and took this picture of this property, I had a little twinge of, of wanting to rehab it because I love old Victorian homes. Um, but fall in love with the numbers. Don't fall in love with the properties, okay? Now in this property, Squatters had done some minor damage inside. Uh, there was a small little fire, uh, but the current market value of this property was $125,000. ARV, because again, there's that reformed rehabber in me, ARV was 225,000, okay? Now, all in for this note, this non-performing note was $54,200. Our borrower was deceased. Okay, the heirs did not want to have anything to do with the house, but they would not give us a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Okay, 
one of the things about this property is that it, at the time, the area that it was in was a little rough previously, okay? But it was gentrifying, so it was already in that process. Um, and, but it had been a little bit rough in the past. And if you looked at Google Earth at this property, you would have said, oh, no. <laughs> but again, because we do good due diligence, um, we were able to garner that the, the area was gentrifying, okay? Across the street, brand new rehab, brand new rehab. It wasn't quite done, but it was almost done. Next door and down the rest of the street was multifamily. And this property was zoned R3. Okay, so somebody could have, including us, somebody could have torn this property down and built an apartment complex uh, because it was zoned R R3, okay? Fortunately, that did not happen. I was hoping that that did not happen. Now again, squatters had done some minor damage. Uh, and there was a small fire in one little area of the house, but for the most part, it had been updated. So it wasn't severe. It needed updating again but it was in pretty good shape. Um, we did end up taking this to foreclosure auction. Now, again, our total unpaid principal balance on this property was 100, and, or on this note, not the property, $160,000. Our total legal collectible balance was over $217,000, okay? So, but remember what I said, the current market value is only 125. So we, as the bank, again, remember we're the bank, we set the rules. We decided uh, that we were gonna set the opening bid a little lower than current market value of the property because we were hoping to incite a bidding war and that's exactly what happened. So we set the opening bid at $116,828. By the way, I never use round numbers. It's a psychological thing. Um, it, it, it kind of conveys that that's the all in amount. So 116,828, we did have a bidding war. Uh, we sold this property at foreclosure auction for $124,211. Our net profit was 70,000 and change, which is 129% return on transaction. Again, this property, this whole process took six months. So 129% return on transaction. Our JV partner uh, was 65% and ecstatic. That was their, their net profit return. Uh, now again, because I am a reformed rehabber and I really loved this house, uh, I followed up on it a little bit later on. Sure enough, two months later, the top picture is the picture from our realtor and the bottom picture is the, the Zillow listing. Okay, so they fixed it up. As you can see, it's pretty much the same. They fixed it up, did some rehab, and they sold it for $230,000. Now imagine if you were the note investor and did the rehab yourself. The, the profit for that is just off the charts. So I'm sure you can see why I really love note investing and the amount of control and risk mitigation that we have in this space. We also get to create some happiness, which is my next case study. Okay, so this is the last case study. Um, this is a property that is in located in Richmond, Kentucky. Uh, and the note on this, uh, the last, our due diligence showed that the last paid to date was 4-9 of 2012. This was an owner occupied property. Okay, so the family was still living there, but they had not paid on this note since April of 2012. Our all in for this note, which we bought in September of 2018, so there was six and a half years that these people were squatting in their own home. We bought this note for $49,252. Um, I apologize, we bought it and, and our workout costs all in was $49,252. The owner had been occupying this property since 1998. So if you remember my favorite exit strategy, I wanna keep people in their home and I wanna make money doing that, okay? So I kind of knew in my good due diligence uh, that probably these borrowers were gonna want to stay because they'd been there since 1998. Our legal collectible balance on this particular note was $95,000 and change. They had a very high interest rate of 10.99%. And what had happened is the husband had a legal, a, a medical condition 
and he couldn't work for three years. So that is what put them into severe default. But he got better, and now they were in a position uh, to do better and be able to make their mortgage payments, but they were so far behind. Um, our borrowers were contacted by our loss mitigation team. Uh, they definitely wanted to stay in the home. They'd raised their kids in that home. So in March of 2019, we put a trial payment plan, a TPP, in place for six months. Um, and we gave the borrower different options. So we gave them some choice. They could, they could have no deposit, a small deposit, um, and then a bigger deposit. And, and we kind of adjusted payment and interest based on what was gonna be best for them. We gave them the option to choose between three. They chose option number two, okay? Uh, option number two required a $1,000 reinstatement fee, so a chunk of cash up front. We made trial payment plans in the amount of $708 a month, okay, for six months. Now, again, remember everybody, that's free money because that applies to the old loan. So $4,248 in cash flow. It did not apply to the new loan, just the old loan. And then we converted this to a permanent modification on October 1st of 2019. We, what we did is we rolled some of the arrearage into a new unpaid principal balance, so a new balance for their loan. We discounted, so we waived some of the debt. So the new loan started out on October 1st as $87,500 at 8% interest. Right? So we even dropped the, the interest rate by 3%, which is a lot. And then we, we extended the term of the loan to 480 months. That's a 40-year loan because that made the, the P&I payment, the principal and interest payment, um, doable for our borrower. They were going to be able to succeed. Okay, So if you add all that up, the $1,000 deposit plus $4,248 plus, now in the modification, the payment was $608.40, not $708. And the reason for that is during the trial payment plan, there's a success fee. It's called a success fee that our loss mitigation charges. We are allowed uh, to, the borrower can can have be, uh, be compelled to, com to pay that. So they paid that success fee, okay? But once that success fee was paid over those six months, then their P&I payment dropped down to that 608. So that's what the discrepancy is. So if you add all that stuff together, we were looking at a cash on cash return for year one of 25.5%. Now, I mentioned an amortization schedule a little while ago. The amortization schedule, I looked at it. With these terms, if you look at it, for 24 months, about $580, that's the average, per month for 24 months of that $608.40 payment is pure profit, everybody. That's interest. So 580 out of $608 is interest. That's our pure profit, right? But again, we created a win-win situation because we're making money by keeping our borrower in our home. Now, at the end of this, I had the option to sell it to a, another note investor. Um, I actually still have this note in my portfolio and it's performing beautifully. They have not missed a payment at all. It's been great. So I'm cash flowing. Um, but if I needed to, here's another thing I could do. I could sell a chunk of payments to another note investor where I get a chunk of cash. They get the, the allotted payments that they paid for. Um, and then at the end of the term, I get the, the payments back. So I can capture some cash in between all of this, or I can just turn around and sell it to another note investor for slight discount uh, of what the UPB is. So it, let's say the UPB now is about $85,000 because it's been a couple years. I could turn around because I've seasoned the note Right? I've seasoned the note, which means the borrower has paid and I've proven that the borrower is going to be successful. Uh, so I will turn around and sell that note maybe for about a 10%, maybe 12% discount on the UPB, the unpaid principal balance. 
to another note investor. And that gives that other note investor a little bit of equity and so their risk is mitigated as well. So there's so many different things that we can do in notes and note investing when you become the bank. Of course, you know, as I said in, in, in our workshop, we go over all the due diligence ad nauseum because it's so important to know the different nuances to be able to mitigate your risk, okay? But you can create situations like these three all day long, and I do every single day in my business. Uh, so I'm hoping that I was able to convey to you a little bit of why Angel sang for me when I got to the note investing space. Uh, my journey has been very fulfilling. Uh, I generally am able to work with our borrowers at least 30, maybe 40% of the time. Uh, so out of every 10 notes, I'm generally anywhere between three and four that I get them to reperform. Uh, and, and generally we are able to kind of thwart uh, the foreclosures and, and keep those at a minimum, which is awesome. Uh, because again, you know, every home has a heartbeat as far as I'm concerned. And I just, I, I find it very fulfilling to be able to serve not only my borrowers, but my investors too. Uh, you know, my investors, are, get that warm fuzzy feeling because they're earning above average returns as well. So are you ready for some free stuff? Here's some free stuff. Uh, definitely, if you're interested in more information, I'm happy to send it to you. Just go to cashflowchick.com forward slash free uh, and or forward slash info and I'll send you a bunch of free stuff. Uh, and of course, connect with me. Um, you know, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to answer your questions. If, if you have any, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, and my information is here. So my email address, of course, info at cashflowchick, um, Instagram at the cashflowchick. Uh, and of course, follow me on Facebook, YouTube, the litany of social media. Uh, the website is cashflowchick.com. And of course, um, I am Paige Panzarello, and I am the cash flow chick.